Should we uh, get yeah. started? Let's go. Um, so yeah, C++ 17, I added this one. I think someone asked on Slack about it and it's kind of like one of these uh, perennial questions. Um, uh, when can we get C++ 17? And you know, the motivation there comes from obviously like language level features, but also just like the improved standard library, things like file system being yep. better standardized and so on. And um, last time we discussed this, I think it was just the compiler support wasn't generally there. Um, like I didn't think across the board in Clang and GCC, we felt that they had been sufficiently well baked for versions out there for long enough. Um, have things changed? Um, pro probably yes, but now there's a there's a new concern, which is um, you know n not just for the mobile project which we're doing, which requires Android and iOS support, but people are also. I, I think people are starting to compile Envoy on places that may have less modern compilers. So I, I, I think what we need to do here, and this was an action item that I had from a couple of months ago, but I never actually did. So I'll assign myself an action item is, I think we need to do a, a survey um, and actually try to better understand like what OSs people are using, what compilers, and and whether you know we can determine what what the tool chain support would require, and then I think we have to try to figure out where people are actually using Envoy. So could right. could you actually assign me this, and I will get a survey written that we can collaborate on, and then we can send out. Done. Um, and and I can also have someone look at it here here at Lyft on. I, I just I. I suspect that Android and iOS are both behind on support. So like, it wouldn't surprise me if they don't fully support C++ 17 yet. I mean, iOS is they just- They do not. Bang, right. <laughs> Sorry? I was just going to say they do not. We have a couple of Android projects that cannot make the jump with the rest of our code base to C++ 17. Um, yeah. I was the one who proposed this on Slack, so. Um, yeah, they, they do not. Yeah. Our, our experience so far in starting the port has been that there's some surprising things that are, that are missing. So, um, yeah, that's my guess too, is that we will not be able to move or we be able to move, but not, but we'd have to require that we don't use certain features. So for example, like we can't use the file system API or something like that. Um, but if it's okay with people, I think like I will take the action item to start this survey because I just feel like our user base is too wide at this point to really understand what the implication would be. And it's the kind of thing where there's lots of people that use it, but don't come to these calls or even track GitHub and then we'll make the change. And then there'll be a bunch of people hopping on and saying, we can't compile it anymore. Sounds good. And, and, and sorry, and I thought for a while that even at Google, you didn't have C++ 17. Is that not the case anymore? Uh, I think we're heading there pretty quickly if we're not there already. Yeah. But I mean, this would be a blocker for you unless you act like you explicitly have. Well, it, right? I mean, I don't think we're in this issue talking about turning this on like today. You know, this is like, <laughs> will we in a quarter when will we be there? Will we in a quarter's time be at C++ 17? Is this something which is a year off? This kind of thing is essentially what we're interested in learning in, the, in, in this uh, general. Okay. All right. But I mean, it's like you, I mean, you, you as in Google need to fill out the survey also, because if you don't have C++ yeah. 17 for six months, then, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a data point. I mean, an interesting thing to ask in the survey will be, you know, what are you using today? What do you anticipate using in six months? Yeah. Like that, like getting yeah. a, you know, the temporal aspects of this. Okay. Yep. I will, I will work on this uh, survey because it's something that I think we need to do anyway. And I know it's on my list, which is ever increasing and never decreases in size. All right. Uh, I just moved it to the top of the list. So maybe it will, it will go faster. <laughs> I think faster. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, did, did anyone else have any comments on that? Okay, uh, UDP, 
who was uh, behind the UDP based DNS filter item? Oh yeah, that that was me. Um, okay, can you speak close to the microphone? Oh yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think this topic had come up on GitHub a few days back, and uh, we added the UDP support recently, and I saw quite a few issues tacked to my pull request and to the issue I had opened initially. So I wanted to discuss on the call if if there is enough need for us to actually go ahead and add the UDP filter or the DNS filter uh, into the Envoy uh, extensions itself. And if we have to work on a way that everyone agrees on how it should be done. I. I don't have a strong opinion. I, I've heard, like I mentioned in the GitHub, um, I, I've heard of some people wanting this behavior. Um, so like, it wouldn't surprise me if people would use it, but I haven't, I haven't explicitly heard that someone would, would be working on it soon. Um, I know that the Istio people had mentioned maybe wanting this to respond to DNS requests for service discovery. Um, so, so uh, so even we wanted, and so that's the reason. So I'm already, I have started working on it on a private filter repo. Uh, do you think it would make sense that I go ahead and do that? And then we look at how we can bring it back into the code base uh, after, after the fact that it's developed or? I think uh, that's, I think that's fine. I, I, I guess my opinion here is that this seems generally useful. So it's like, it wouldn't surprise me that once it shows up in open source, people will find interesting ways to use it. At the same time, because I haven't heard an explicit request for it, you know, I, I don't want you to like waste your time just doing general open source work for no particular reason. So, I mean, one option may be just to do it in a different repo, but make that repo public. And then you can link back to it so people can look at it hmm. and then you know if there's interest we can just get it upstreamed um, yeah that makes sense so that's what i figured and i started along that approach so i think my repo is public right now so i'll just yeah, continue so, doing that. yeah so maybe just link to your repo in the github yeah. issue so people can follow that thread sure. uh, and then if there's interest we can we can get it upstreamed okay makes sense yeah or or if you know it it you can make your own decision later in a sense that where the benefit of getting it upstreamed, of course, is that then, you know, we, we do all the refactors together and we fix the bugs and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, there might be, there might be benefit for you to getting it upstreamed, but I'll, yeah. I'll leave that to you in, in terms of what you want to do. Okay. And is there any, uh, is there any examples of how extensions uh, use the external dependencies that Envoy itself has? Yeah, so there's the Envoy filter example repo, which yeah. does basically exactly what you what you want to do. Okay. Oh, no, the Envoy filter example doesn't actually use Envoy's... External uh, dependencies. dependencies. It uses Envoy as an external dependency. And so, right. I, but I mean, I think like many of Envoy's baked in filters are making use of external dependencies, which live in the Envoy repo proper, like the thrift one or the uh, various GRPC ones. I mean, there's but not they live in the much, same repo, right? Yeah. But there's not that much difference when you're in an external repo, really. Okay. Basically yeah. like Basil flattens out the namespaces, uh, okay. basically your workspace. So basically all Envoy's external uh, dependencies appear um, as top level external dependencies of any project that consumes Envoy. Okay, okay, that sounds good. It's because yeah, I'm right. planning to use the CRS dependency that's already there in Envoy. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I wanted to see if I have to add that as an external dependency to my repo separately, or can I just use it since it's already in Envoy? You can just use that. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Yeah, once it's once it's loaded in, you should be able to refer to it using okay. normal normal Bazel notation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's it from my side then. Okay. Do you do you know Lizon whether the Istio people w would actually So use I this? think I think that idea came up a couple of times, but we don't have that in concrete roadmap for like it 
any like timeline yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of thing though where I I I just suspect that if the code was written and working yeah. and available, yeah. pe people yeah. would be, people would use it. That's my right, guess. right, right. That that's that's much as my guess as well. Okay. Yeah. So so maybe just get the code working and then drop a link in the repo and then if there's interest or if you want to, we can yeah. get it upstream. Yeah. It's uh it's uh, Michael here from JP Morgan. I know the Pivotal folks were looking to get um, UDP support. Uh, Shannon Cohen, if you go back through some of the issues, might be interesting to check them with the Pivotal folks. I know that I, we'd expressed, I'd expressed interest too, but our sort of use case for the public cloud has sort of gone away now. But uh, I'm sure that we would be interested uh, down the track as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the other use case here that your PR unlocked is that it's actually will be, I think, relatively little work to do upstream UDP now. So, you know, if someone is out there who wants to finish that work, we can now do end, end to end UDP proxy. I think it would be not very difficult, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So do everyone just enter their own names in the attendees list or is someone updating that? <laughs> oh, you can just type in there if you want. I mean, okay. it's, it's okay. optional, you know, I see. Okay. If you, don't, if you don't like to be tracked. <laughs> cool. Do we have any other agenda items from the community? I don't, I can't think of anything. Uh, the only thing I uh, will mention is that we're getting ready for planning for EnvoyCon uh, 2019. So hopefully we'll have the CFP open uh, by the end of next week, maybe. And we'll be looking for people to join the program committee. So if you're interested in reviewing CFPs, uh, feel free to reach out. I will add that to the uh, agenda. Is there a, a registered like limit on how many people can attend the event? Yeah, there's a limit. So um, last year we sold out uh, and, and pre pretty fast. So I think we underestimated the demand. Um, okay. I think this year we're going for slightly bigger venues. So we'll be able to probably have about 500 people. Um, so hopefully it, it, it won't sell out quite so fast. It's going to be co-located with KubeCon in San Diego. So it'll be the Monday before KubeCon. I think it'll be like November 18th or something along those lines in San Diego. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm trying to think of other general announcements. I can't think of anything. Did anyone out there have any questions or things to chat about? Okay. All right. Call it early. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.